Hello everyone, if you're new here, welcome. My name is Keisha and today I'm going to be doing a book haul that is all of the books that I hauled from my Nashville girls trip. just got back from Nashville a couple of weeks ago. I did some book shopping with some of my besties, Gwen and Gabby, and I ended up bringing back 36 books. I do have 38 books to haul today because I got two books when I came back because, you know, I'm the problem, it's me, but it's fine. We love books over here. So I'm gonna go ahead and haul all of these books. I've sorted them from the different stores that I got them from, so that's how we're gonna do this organization today. And let's just go ahead and jump into it. The first place that we went on the trip was Half Price Books. And I only got one book at Half Price Books, believe it or not. And the book that I got is House, The Only Way Out Is In by Frank Peretti and Ted Decker. This is a Christian mystery thriller or suspense novel. I have read one from Ted Decker before. I've read three and I really enjoyed that one, but I've never read anything from Frank Peretti. I know nothing about this book. The only thing that I'm going to tell you guys and tell myself is from this blurb. It says it's a mind-bending supernatural thriller. It also says one game, seven players, three rules, game ends at dawn. So I'm excited to jump into this one. I'm trying out some more Christian fiction books, and so hopefully this will introduce me to Frank Peretti and then just allow me to dive back into some Ted Decker as well. Next, we went to Books A Million, and I ended up buying four books, but I came out with five because Gabby was sneaky, and there was a book that I was putting back that she got for me. So let's just start with the one that Gabby got for me. That is Death By Coffee, a bookstore cafe mystery by Alex Erickson. I don't know much about this series. I just thought it sounded cute. It says, when Chrissy Hancock and her best friend Vicky decide to open a bookstore cafe in their new town of Pine Hills, they decide to call it Death By Coffee after Chrissy's father's most famous mystery novel. Little do they know how well the name fits. So I'm really excited. I'm very much still in my cozy era. I kind of have been all year. So I think cozy mysteries are a new favorite thing for me. So I'm really excited to check that one out. Then there's a book that ever since I saw it, I was like, I have to have this book and I've been saving it to buy on this trip. And that is the door to door bookstore by Karsten Hinn. I believe this is translated from German. I may be mistaken, but I think it's from German. And it's a very short book and it gives me the story life of AJ Fickery vibes, which is all I need to know to want this book. It says the charming international bestseller about an unlikely friendship between an elderly door to door bookseller and a nine year old girl that changes his life. That's all that I needed to know to pick this one up. Hopefully that's enough to intrigue you. It is also a short book, but I'm going to be reading this one very soon. Then I got a few middle grade books and I believe they're all spooky middle grade. So the first one I got is Field of Screams by Wendy Paris. This has been one of my most anticipated spooky middle grade books that released just, I think this last month. I don't know a lot about it either. I'll go ahead and read you guys the back of this one because you guys, if you're here, you know I love spooky middle grade, so maybe you do too. So it says, Rebecca has always wanted to hunt ghosts until she meets one. Paranormal enthusiast Rebecca Graff isn't happy about being dragged to Iowa to spend the summer with family she barely knows. But when she tracks a ghostly presence to an abandoned farmhouse, she starts to think the summer won't be a total lost cause. The trouble is, no one around her believes in ghosts. Then Rebecca finds a note stashed in a comic belonging to her late father, a note proving that the same ghost haunted him when he was 12. Suddenly, she feels a connection to the dad she pretends not to miss, and she is determined to uncover the story behind the haunting. But the more Rebecca discovers, the scarier the ghost becomes. Soon she is in a rare, in a race to piece together the puzzle and recover a family legacy before it is lost forever and a horrible tragedy repeats itself. Very intrigued by this one, a little scared about it. I am kind of shifting in my reading some, so some of my spooky reading may change, but I'll definitely let you guys know what I think about this one when I get to it, which will hopefully be pretty soon. I think that I put this on an upcoming TBR for this month. So. Then I got Misfit Mansion by Kay DeVault. This is another highly anticipated release for me. This is a middle grade graphic novel and it says it's great for fans of Foster's Home for, Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, which I don't know if any of you guys watched that on Cartoon Network as a kid, but I loved that show. I didn't watch it as much as other things, but I did really enjoy it. I love the color palette in this book and this is just basically like a house of monsters. I don't know much more about it than that. It says, 
that this is Foster Home for Horrors. So it looks really cute and I'm really excited to get to it this fall. Then I got another spooky middle grade graphic novel, which I'm unsure about because this thing is super creepy, but it's kind of a compilation of short stories. It's called Eerie Tales from the School of Screams by Graham Annabelle, or Annabelle, Annabelle, maybe that's how you pronounce it. Don't know a lot about this one either, except that it's a bunch of scary short stories. It says there are five horrifying stories that will scare your skeleton right out of your skin. Um, and I think it, a lot of them maybe take place during a school setting. So, I mean, it is called School of Screams. So, there are some very interesting illustrations in here. There's one in particular that really spooked me, but I won't share it because I think this is spooky enough. But again, very highly anticipating this one as well. Then we visited McKay's, which you all know is like Disney World to me. So, the books that I got at McKay's actually went back to after, like, the girls left after I dropped them off the airport. I had to swing by one more time just to double check. But I got quite a few books at McKay's. And I got quite a few of one genre. This whole trip, I'm pretty sure I know what genre I got the most of. If you want to guess before the end of the video what genre I got the most books from, comment down below. I'm curious to see how many of you will guess it, but there are definitely a lot in this haul. So the first book that I grabbed, you guys know I love The Secret Garden. So I got The Secret Garden by Frances Hodgson Burnett. I'm collecting certain editions of this, I've come to find out. So this one is just like a really pretty classic edition. I love that it has the sprayed edges and it just gives me nostalgic vibes. There are little keyholes and birds um, on the end pages. And this is kind of what the inside looks like. There are illustrations throughout that look like this, but there are also illustrations in this one section that are colored. And so I just thought this was super cute and one I definitely wanted to add to my collection. Another middle grade that I got, I've actually read the um, picture book version of this when I used to work as a children's librarian, but I didn't know that they had a middle grade novelization of this. So this is A Winnie's Great War by Lindsay Maddock and Josh Greenhut, and the art is by Sophie Blackall. This is a novel based on the true story of the world's most famous bear, Winnie the Pooh. So in case you guys didn't know, Winnie the Pooh, the whole story of Winnie the Pooh, all the stories ever written, um, the TV shows and movies produced were all based on a real bear. And I believe this took place during, well, obviously the Great War. And this soldier found Winnie and Winnie kind of went along with the soldier. I think they brought the, um, the bear back to the States. I don't remember all about it. It's been a while since I read the story, but I'm really excited to reread it in a more detailed format. There are pictures in the back as well that tell a little bit more into the history. So I'm really excited to have this one. Then Gwen and I both got this graphic novel. I think it's a young adult. It's called Heartless Prince. And this is by Angela DeVito and Lee Dragoon. So I'm really excited for this one. I have not heard anybody talk about it, but I have been really interested in it for quite some, quite some time. Um, you guys can tell it's been a minute since I filmed like a sit down video because I'm stumbling so much. <laughs> but I'm really excited to check it out. It is a fantasy. I'm not sure if I'll like it or not, but I've definitely been intrigued by it. And I'm not really sure what it's about. I forgot. I say that about all these books. Like I just know I'm interested, but there's so many books that I'm interested in. I can't remember exactly all the synopses. So we're going to read this one. Ebony is an orphaned princess from a kingdom destroyed by a power hungry witch. Prince Eamon has recently been drawn to her, or at least he's drawn to her uncanny ability to sense when familiars, servants to the witches, are approaching his kingdom's borders. And Ebony, well, Ebony has always longed for something more with Eamon. Wanting to prove himself to his kingdom and parents, Eamon takes Ebony outside the borders to fight their family's fa familiars face to face. All is well until they're captured by the witch Aradia, who steals Eamon's heart and leaves his body to turn into one of her familiars. What's worse, his sister, Nyssa, has been taken hostage by Aradia's daughter. Ebony makes it her mission to retrieve Eamon's heart and save Nyssa, taking her into the mysterious Witchlands. There, she will discover a secret about her past that will change everything. Then I got a couple of Christian nonfiction books. The first one that I got is Gentle and Lowly, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers by Dane Ortland. I have seen this one all over Bookstagram from Christian Bookstagrammers recently, but the thing that really sold me on getting this one is both my friends Jordan and Lauren really, really love this book, and so I knew I had to pick it up if it was coming recommended from them. So I don't know a lot about it, except that it just is going to make me emotional because it's going to talk about God's heart for me a lot and just like understanding who he is 
for me and to me and I'm just really excited to jump into this one and then I got what if love is the point by Carlos and Alexa Pinavega so I grew up with both of these actors actresses and so Alexa she was what was the, what was her name she was in spy kids I know Junie and what was her name Why do I not remember? Anyways, you guys know she was in Spy Kids and then her husband Carlos was one of the band members and still is one of the band members in Big Time Rush. So I grew up with both of them and I absolutely love that they are so public and real and raw about their faith. And so I'm really excited to just kind of get a little bit, I guess, of their memoir. Um, let's see, it says, the Pinavegas offer an inspiring window into how God builds young faith and strengthens it into lasting love give insight into how to put God at the center of relationships, family, and career, explore why society's expectations never fulfill our true needs, and share ideas for resisting the hustle of today's culture and finding a true rest. So, really excited to read from them. I don't read a lot of memoirs, but again, I just grew up with them and really love them. Then when I went back to McKay's, I got three more books. So, I got The Secret Life of Bees by Sue Monk Kid, which I've had before and unhauled before without reading. But I love this movie and I really want to give this book another try. I feel like it's kind of a more modern classic. If you don't know what it's about, look it up. I'm getting to a point where I'm like, okay, I've already been talking a long time and I still have a lot of books left. But it's really good. I had to have it. Then Gabby ended up picking up some historical fiction and one of the ones she picked up I've really been interested in for a long time so I decided to pick it up with her and hopefully we'll buddy read it soon. It's called The Last Bookshop in London, a novel of World War II by Madeline Martin. So this one says August 1939. London prepares for war as Hitler's forces sweep across Europe. Grace Bennett has always dreamed of moving to the city but the bunkers and drawn curtains that she finds on her arrival are not what she expected. And she certainly never imagined she'd wind up working at Primrose Hill, a dusty old bookshop nestled in the heart of London. Through blackouts and air raids as the blitz intensifies, Grace discovers the power of storytelling to unite her community in ways she never dreamed, a force that triumphs over even the darkest nights of the war. This gave me Guernsey Literary and Potato Pie Society vibes, so that was initially why I picked this one up, or why it was like added to my TBR. And I'm really excited to hopefully get to it soon. I'm glad it's shorter because I don't read a lot of historical fiction. So hopefully that one is a new favorite for me. This one is also historical fiction. I didn't really realize it when I first picked it up. So this one is The Bookshop of the Broken Hearted by Robert Hillman. Obviously the cover drew, drew me in on this one. I really like books about books, but I'm very particular about the ones that I like. I think it just depends on the writing. This one sounded really cute though. It says, can one unlikely bookshop heal two broken souls? It is 1968 in rural Australia and lonely Tom Hope can't make heads or tails of Hannah Babel. Newly arrived from Hungary, she's passionate, brilliant, and fiercely determined to open Sleepy Hometown's first bookshop. Despite the fact that Tom has read only one book in his life, when he installs shelving in Hannah's shop, the two discover an astonishing spark. Recently abandoned by his wife and still missing her sweet son, Peter, Tom believes he might make Hannah happy, but Hannah has a past Tom can barely comprehend. 24 years earlier, she had been marched to the gates of Auschwitz. The Bookshop of the Brokenhearted is a gorgeously written, gentle-spirited, and wise novel that reminds each of us that love, literature, and forgiveness have the power to transform our lives, and if we dare allow them, to mend our broken hearts. It just sounds amazing. I just, I can't. Okay, now we've got a lot of cozies, because I love my cozies. So, I've been looking for some of these cozies for ages, and I knew McKay's always has an impeccable cozy collection. They have so many that there's just like, you're almost always guaranteed to find what you're looking for. So I did read, what was that book called? Um, Crime and Poetry by Amanda Flower. It is one of my new all-time favorite cozies. You guys hear me talk a lot about Buried in a Good Book and I don't feel like I've talked enough about Crime and Poetry, but it is so cute. It is like a magical bookshop mystery series with a sweet little old granny and her granddaughter and they live kind of near Niagara Falls. And I just love it so much. The books are magical. Um, they like speak to you and stuff like that. Not like verbally, but you know. Anyways, it's really, really cute. It's very light on the magic, but it's very, very cute and wholesome. And honestly, I feel like I'm going to love everything Amanda Flower has written. So I did end up getting Pros and Cons and Murders and Metaphors, which is book two and three in the Magical Bookshop Mystery Series. So I'm really excited to continue on and I just love these characters. I'm so excited. Like it just makes my heart so happy. So I got those two. Then I decided to try out. I had just, 
have really not thought that I was going to like this book for a long time, but I'm going to give it a try. So this is Apple Cider Slaying by Julianne Lindsay. I plan on reading this maybe in November around Thanksgiving slash Christmas because I think it starts out in Thanksgiving. There is a place that I've visited. It's the Apple Barn in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and I love that place. And I feel like maybe if I just like think about that place while I'm reading this, then I will love it even more. But I know that the Cozy Hollow Book Club read this last year and I missed out on it because I just really wasn't super interested in it, but I wanna give it a try now and see if I like it. So I'm very excited for that one. Another Cozy that I have read recently was Homicide in Hardcover. And I love that one. And so I had to get the second one. I gave that one four stars, I think. So this one is If Books Could Kill by Kate Carlisle. And this is a bibliophile mystery. So this is book two. And it takes place, I think, in New York City or around that area, maybe in Boston. I'm not really sure. Let me see. Um, it may not even tell, but I think it's around New York City. But this is the first book, in case you're wondering, Homicide and Hardcover. And then the second one is If Books Could Kill. And you have a book binder, which I thought was a really interesting concept because I like the idea of book binding. So I really enjoyed it more than I thought I would. It does read more like a classic cozy, but I'm excited to continue in the series and see if I want to stick with it. Then I got another Amanda Flower, which I have completely destroyed trying to get the sticker off. This is why we don't put stickers on books, people. Um, the sticker had actually been on there for a really long time, and that's why this happened. But if I end up loving this one, I'll just return this to McKay's and then I'll go buy myself a better copy. But it did make me sad. So I got a Salted Caramel and Amish Candy Shop Mystery by Amanda Flower. Again, I love Amanda Flower so far. So I'm hoping to love this one. I don't always love foodie books like foodie romance, foodie cozies. Like I don't always love that. So this is a stretch for me. I may not like it, but I'm going to try it because I like Amanda Flower. So we shall see. Another one that I've been so excited for and I finally found it is Dead as a Door Knocker by Diane Kelly. So this is a house flipper mystery and it takes place in Nashville. So obviously I had to get it. Don't know a lot about it other than that, but I'm very excited to finally own it and be able to start that series. Then I had no idea for the longest time that there was a show that actually had a cozy series. So I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with Candace Cameron Bure. She plays Aurora Tea Garden. Well, you may know her from Full House as DJ Tanner, but she plays Aurora Tea Garden in like Hallmark Movies and Mysteries. They have that show called Aurora Tea Garden Mysteries. It's based on a cozy mystery series by Charlene Harris. So I got it. The first one is Real Murders. I don't love the cover of this one, but I'm intrigued to pick it up because I really want to watch the show. I'm like, well, let me read the books first because, you know, I don't know. There's probably a thousand books in the series, but I wanted to give it a try. So that's that. Then I got another book called A Dark and Stormy Murder, A Writer, Writer's Apprentice Mystery by Julia Buckley. I have seen this one around here and there and just something about it. I just, I love the gothic feel to it. I don't remember a lot about this one though. Let's see. Camilla's, Camilla Graham's best-selling suspense novels inspired Lena London to become a writer. So when she lands a job as Camilla's new assistant, she can't believe her luck. Not only will she help her idol craft an enchanting new mystery, she'll get to live rent-free in Camilla's gorgeous gothic home in the quaint town of Blue Lake, Indiana. But Lena's fortune soon changes for the worse. First, she lands in the center of small-town gossip for befriending the local recluse. Then she stumbles across one thing that a Camilla Graham novel is never without, a dead body found on her new boss's lakefront property. Now Lena must take a page out of one of Camilla's books to hunt down clues in a real crime that seems to be connected to the novelist's mysterious estate before the killer writes them both out of the story for good. This reminds me, not in the same, y'all have to understand when I say this, it's just elements of the story. So I'm gonna say Verity, but it's because like she came to finish like Verity's books or whatever, like it was a whole different thing. And then The 13th Tale by Diane Setterfield and also The Only One Left by Riley Sager. It's just like the gothic vibes, but then somebody's a writer and they're coming to help somebody else write or do something like that. I don't know, it just sounds really good. So I'm very excited for that one. Then, I found two cozies that I've never heard of before, and I'm so excited about them. So, the first one is Peaches and Scream, a Georgia Peach Mystery by Suzanne Furlong. I'm reading this one, like, in the next week. I'm so pumped for this one. I have to read y'all the back because Buried in a Good Book by Tamara Berry, the back of it, like, the synopsis had all the puns, and this one has puns, and I love puns, so I gotta read this to y'all. When murder threatens her family's orchard, Nola Mae Harper, I love her name, it's so Southern, is ready to pick out the killer and preserve the farm's reputation. To help run the family peach farm during her parents' absence, Nola Mae Harper returns to her childhood home of Case Mill, Georgia, and soon discovers that things back at the farm aren't exactly peachy. 
A poor harvest and rising costs are threatening to ruin the Harper's livelihood, and small town gossip is spreading like blight, like blight thanks to Nola's juicy reputation as a wild teenager way back when. But Nola really finds herself in the pits when she stumbles upon a local businessman murdered among the peach trees. With suspicions and family tensions heating up faster than a cobbler in the oven, this sweet Georgia peach will have to prune through a list of murder suspects before she too becomes ripe for the killer's picking. This also has peach recipes and I'm just really excited because I kind of want to make peach cobbler when I read this. Will I? I don't know. But now I kind of want to do that. Maybe I will. Then the other book that I got that I've never heard of is Killer Librarian by Mary Lou Kerwin. I really like the blurb on this one. It says that when she checks in, someone always checks out. So let me tell y'all about this one. This one seems like a little bit darker of a cozy, so I don't know, but I'm intrigued. File M for murder. Champion of the mystery section at a small town Minnesota library, Karen Nash is about to embark on a dream trip to London, a literary tour inspired by every murderous intrigue, wily suspect, suspect, and ingenious crime found in the pages of the British mysteries that she devours. But she's clueless why the love of her midlife, Dave, would dump her hours before takeoff until she spies him at the airport with a young honey on his arm. She decides the best revenge, for now, is to get on that plane anyway and entertain schemes for Dave's untimely demise while crossing the pond. After touching ground in the hallowed homeland of Christie, Sayers, and Peters, she checks into a cozy B&B &B run by charming bibliophile Caldwell Perkins. Soon she's spilling tears into, into her, in her pint at the corner pub, sharing her heartbreak saga with a stranger. That night, a B&B &B guest drops out of circulation permanently. And when Dave and his cutie turn up in London, Karen realizes they are an assassin's target. With the meticulous attention to detail that makes her a killer librarian, Karen sleuths her way through her own real life mystery in which library science meets the art of murder. If that doesn't sound good, I don't know what does. All right, moving on then. So that, that was a huge haul from the case. So the next haul is from Barnes and Noble, which is probably my next biggest haul. Um, so I ended up getting another cozy. Is anybody surprised? Probably not. Okay, so I got Death in Bloom by Jess Dillon. And I'm so sorry that I don't remember exactly who recommended this to me. But if you were that person, please let me know in the comments because I can't remember exactly who it was. Um, but somebody recommended this to me. This is a flower house mystery. And they said, because I liked crime and poetry, that I'd probably like this one. So I'm like, okay, well, obviously I love that one. And it takes place in Tennessee. So, I mean, I had to get it. It says, at the flower house, every rose has its thorn. Sierra Ravenswood is the new part-time employee of the Flower House, a flower shop in Aryville, Tennessee. It's true she didn't expect to be back in her hometown at 28 years old, but after her dream of making it as a singer in Nashville crashed and burned, she's just grateful to have found a soft place to land. Because after all, Sierra firmly believes in being optimistic and positive about life. But things take a decidedly negative turn when a customer drops dead in the middle of her bouquet, bouquet arranging workshop at the store. When it's discovered he was poisoned by a snack at the event, Everyone at the workshop, including Sierra, is on the suspect list. To make matters worse, her boss has gone AWOL, leaving Sierra in charge of both his store and his high-energy corgi pup, Gus. Which, there he is. He's so cute. The town is on edge, and Sierra knows that murder is something that an upbeat attitude and a bouquet of sweet-smelling roses can't fix. She's determined to figure out who done it before anyone else in the town meets an untimely reason for needing funeral flowers. So, excited for that one. Then I got three Christian fiction books, and... Don't just turn this off when I say that, okay? Because these sound so good and I'm so excited to share them with you. Um, I'm somebody who doesn't want like super corny books, okay? Like I don't want super, like I want to know, like I want to feel God like when I read. I want to be able to pick up on some like faith elements in books, but I don't want it to be oversaturated and just like super cheesy because that's not my jam. So I feel like these hopefully will be good. I don't know for sure, okay? They may be cheesy. I don't know, but we're going to try them. I've got to tell y'all about Dear Henry Love Edith, okay? This is by Becca Kinzer, and I have heard, um, I think Amanda has talked about this one from Book Lover Amanda. I don't remember if she's read it yet, but I know Oshina has read it from Oshina, Re Oshina Gotta Read Them All. Um, she's read it and loved it, and I'm just so excited for this book. Let me tell you a little bit about what's it, what it's about. So, you have Henry and Edith, and they are living in an apartment together. So, I think it's Henry's niece or somebody. I can't remember. He's like, hey, you know, there's this widow who needs a place to stay. And so Henry thinks that Edith is an old woman. So he says, yeah, she can come and stay with me, but they are never going to see each other because they are at their like house at different times. So Henry thinks Edith is an old woman. And then Edith comes to stay with Henry and she thinks he's an old man, but they're both young. So they end up writing letters back and forth to each other to kind of get to know each other since they're kind of bypassing each other all the time. But again, they think each other's old. 
Meanwhile, out in public, Henry and Edith actually meet in person and start to fall in love. And then they start to talk about each other in the letters and don't realize like they're the same people. So I'm just like, that sounds like such a good setup for a romance. Very excited for this one. And I will be reading it, hopefully if I can, I'm gonna try to save it for like a little later. But I don't know, I'm just really excited for this one, y'all. I just, I just gotta tell you. Um, the next one that I got is A Stranger's Game by Colleen Coble. Colleen Coble writes romantic suspense in Christian fiction. So this one says, a wealthy hotel heiress. Even though Tori Bergstrom hasn't been back to Georgia since she was 10, she's happy to arrange a job for her best friend at one of the family properties on Jekyll Island. A suspicious death. But when Tori learns that her best friend is drowned, she knows it is more than a tragic accident. Lisbeth was terrified of water and wouldn't have gone swimming by choice. A fight for the truth. Tori goes to the hotel under an alias, desperate to find answers, when she meets Joe Abbott and his daughter rescuing baby turtles. How cute. She finds a tentative ally. The more Tori and Joe dig, the more elusive the truth seems. One thing is clear. Someone will risk anything, even more murder, to keep their secrets buried. I believe this is the first book in a series. I think she does write a lot of series, which I don't love. I mean, except cozy mysteries, but maybe, maybe this will be good. So I'm going to try calling Cobble. I'm very excited for that. And then all of you have probably heard of this one. This one is The Happy Life of Isadora Bentley by Courtney Walsh. I don't know a lot about this one, except that it follows Isadora Bentley. I think there's some romance in it, but it more follows Isadora and like her coming into her own and realizing who she is and just like being comfortable with herself. The thing that really sold me on this one is that I read the first, well, first of all, it sold me because it was Courtney Walsh and I, the uh, Cross Country Christmas is like one of my favorite romances of all time, if not my favorite. But the first little bit of this book talks about how she's turning 30. So she's like, I'm three decades old. I've spent 10,950 days on this planet and I really thought my life would look a lot different by now. Like how relatable. So I will turn 30 in September, which is next month. And I'm like, okay, this is timely. I have to read this book. So I'm very excited for this one. Courtney Walsh's writing is really great. So I have no doubts it's going to be a good one. I have two more books from Barnes & Noble. So the first one is a young adult romance. It's called Better Than the Movies by Lynn Painter. So I've heard about Lynn Painter a lot, especially from Rachel from Happy Go Lovely Sleeves. I believe this is one of her favorite romance authors. I wanted to try YA because I'm trying not to read smut anymore. I just really don't care for it. I never have. I got myself accustomed to reading it here and there. But overall, I really like closed door clean romances. So I'm trying to stick to that. I think this has some steam in it, but I don't think it really gets into, you know, like the nitty gritty, especially if, with it being YA. The only thing I know about this is it is, I think it's friends to lovers, maybe like child friends to lovers or friends to lovers. I may be wrong, but it revolves around rom-coms. It's very rom com -y, which we love a good rom-com. I love how at the beginning of each chapter, which first of all, this picture is super cute, but I love how at the beginning of each chapter, it has a quote from, from a rom-com. So it has a Notting Hill quote, a Sweet Home Al Alabama quote. Wow, I cannot speak today. Um, it also has, I think you got mail is the next quote. When Harry Met Sally. I mean, there's just so many 10 things I hate about you. And I love that each chapter starts with a rom-com quote. So very excited for that. I think it's going to be a good one, hopefully. So this will be my first time trying Lynn Painter. The next book I have is a middle grade graphic novel. This is a translated work from French. And you guys may remember me talking about the first book. So I have so Source Align Book 2 by Sylvia Doye and Paolo Antista. I'm very, very excited that this one has finally come out. Like I said, it is translated, so it takes a while. There's more out in French than there are in um, English. But I absolutely loved the first one. It kind of has elements of Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them because this is a school for like training or taking care of magical creatures and then it also has like some Greek mythology elements and just I don't know it just is such a good time so I'm very excited to read this one really soon. The next couple stacks that I have will hopefully go by a little quicker so these are from all the independent bookstores so the first one that we went to was Landmark Booksellers in Franklin well it wasn't the first one we went to but well I think it is I don't know anyways so I got a couple of Christian nonfiction. so my husband and I used to co-pastor a church with this guy. And so this is Make Good Tables and Covered in Dust by Jonah Lusk. So this is a local author. He lives in Tennessee, he's local to us. And so he has had two books published and I wanted to pick those up and just give those a read because it's been a while since I've heard him preach and he was always really good um, preaching. And it was really fun too, because we used to hear Jonah and my husband, Will would like tag team preach. So they literally would prepare a sermon, then get up and both preach without knowing kind of, they would have a topic, 
but they would tag team preach so they would bounce off each other without really knowing exactly what the other one was going to say and it was just such an amazing like holy spirit filled experience um but they also preached separate too but anyways they co-pastor together and like i said it's been a while since i've heard jonah preach and i just decided to pick up his books to give those a try also and then i ended up getting little lord fauntleroy by francis hodgson burnett because this cover was just too cute and I really don't care for Regency or like royalty or anything like that, especially like not in this time period. It's like 18, no, when is this? The publication was in the 1880s. Anyways, I read the synopsis and I was like, you know, maybe, maybe this will be a good one. But what really sold me was this quote on the back. And this is what gets me about Francis Hodgson Burnett every time. So it says, it was really a very simple thing after all. It was only that he had lived near a kind and gentle heart and had been taught to think kind thoughts always and to care for others. It is a very little thing, perhaps, but it is the best thing of all. And I was like, okay, I have to get it. I have to try all of Francis Hodgson Burnett's books, especially since I love The Secret Garden. So I got this one. And I don't think this one has any pictures in it, which is kind of sad, but that's okay because I really like the cover. Then, um, let's see, here's the other independent bookstore ones. I only got one book from each of these. So first we went to Parnassus. And I got The International House of Dereliction by Jacqueline Davies. This is a book that has been so highly anticipated for me this year. It is a spooky middle grade, so of course it's highly anticipated for me. And it revolves around this girl who has a house next door that I think they're going to demolish. I don't think they're renovating it. I think they're going to demolish it or something. Oh, I just realized this was bent and I probably did that to it. Oh no. It's okay. It's going to be fine. But it's bent. Um, I think they're demolishing it. But anyways... She meets these ghosts in this house, and I think it's going to be one of those, like, helping the ghosts crossover type deals. I don't know. A beating heart, a condemned house, a trio of restless ghosts. What could go wrong? And then there's something in the attic. So, I don't know. It just sounds so, so good. Um, I've really been looking forward to it. It is a short book. I love the cover. Super pumped for it. Then we went to Novelette Booksellers, and I got The Not-So-Nice Girl by Sky McDonald. This cover is really what drew me in. This is a local author in the Nashville area. And I love the 80s vibes of this book. So I feel like most people probably haven't seen this one around because I sure haven't. Not to say that I've seen everything, but I feel like because she's a local author and independently, independently published, I believe, then you probably have not heard of this one. So let me tell you about it. It says, Eleanor Field wants nothing more than to spend a drama-free summer in Nashville listening to rock and roll and baking pastries. But her plans are derailed when she walks into a local record shop and meets Sam Green, a newly graduated, newly single guy who's looking for a stress-free summer of his own. Despite their instant attraction, neither of them is looking for anything serious. But as they continue to spend time together, their friendship lays the groundwork for something deeper. Set in the summer of 1986, The Not-So-Nice Girl is a heartwarming romance about two people who find love when they least expect it. Eleanor and Sam share a mutual love of music, a deep connection, and a group of friends who bring them even closer. But can they overcome their baggage and fears to take their relationship to the next level? Can Eleanor, a free spirit who's always on the move, admit that she's found a home in Sam? And can Sam, a sweet guy who's too nice for his own good, be bold enough to say what he really wants? With its 80s setting and rock and roll soundtrack, The Not-So-Nice Girl is a nostalgic and romantic read that will transport you to a time of mixtapes, pastries, and first love. Very excited for this one. It's a charming story of friendship, love, and the power of taking a chance. Now, I do have reservations because I know there's cursing in this. I don't know how much. I hope it's not overdone. And I'm pretty sure because I, I don't think that this is a clean romance, there may be some smut. I'm hoping it's very minimal because I know it ruined another book that I was really excited for recently um, whenever I read that. But I'm going to give it a try. I will report back and let you guys know. But I love the synopsis and like the friends to lovers and the 80s vibes. Like I'm pumped for that. And then the last book that I got on the trip is Looking Glass Sound by Katrina Ward. I got this one at the bookshop and I'm very excited to read this one. I'm a little nervous, but I'm very excited because you guys know I love The Last House on Needless Street. That book took me by storm, wrecked my emotions, made me empathetic for certain people and I just loved it. I loved it so much. Um, so this one sounds really good. I feel like most of you guys have probably heard about it if you're here, so I'm not going to go into the synopsis, but she does write horror books and I'm trying to veer from certain things. Like I've tried a couple of her other books and I didn't like them. And I read Sundial, I gave it four stars, but upon like further thinking about it, I just don't believe that that is a book that I really enjoyed the story of. Like it was really well written and the story was good, but it just wasn't my preference. So I'm hoping this was good. 
it sounds good. I mean, I don't know. I love the setting of it. It's, um, let's see, it's about friendship, betrayal, dark obsessions, and the impossibility of escaping your own story. And it is psychological, which I tend to really like. So I'm hoping this will be a win for me. And last but not least, I did get two books coming back from my trip. So I had to get this one from Amazon because I am going to be reading it for the Back to School Readathon this week. So this is L's, E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, open parentheses, S, close parentheses, by um, Avalon Stokart and Kid Toussaint, or Toussaint. I don't, I'm not really sure how to pronounce that, so I'm sorry if I mispronounced. But this is a graphic novel that has a very Pixar-like art style. And it is about this girl who starts at a new school and she has multiple personality disorders. So you've got her and all of her different personalities. I really like mental health representation in books. So I'm hoping this is done well. I believe this is also a translated work, but I can't remember what it's translated from. Let me see if I can find out. Oh, I love this artwork too. It looks like it's gonna be really good. Um, You know, it may be French because it looks French. I'm not quite sure, but it looks French. So I'm really excited for this one. I think it's going to be a good time. There are multiple books in the series. So hopefully it'll be a new one that I love. And then I got this book for $3, y'all. We have like a local Christian book outlet near us. Y'all, like this was $3. Okay, so I got a new Jamie Jo Wright. I just recently read my first Jamie Jo Wright and I liked it, but I didn't love it. But I liked it enough to try more from her. She writes thrillers and she writes kind of historical thrillers so you have a back and forth timeline um and they're historical and they are mysterious and creepy and spooky sorry if you guys can hear the train in the background i'm almost done so hopefully it won't be too much of a nuisance but anyways i'm hoping that she can be like a christian fiction jennifer mcmahon for me because i love jennifer mcmahon but some of her stuff gets a little bit too dark for me so this is the curse of misty wayfair by jamie joe wright and I'm going to tell you guys what this is about because this sounds so stinking good. It says, left at an orphanage as a child, Thea Reed vowed to find her mother someday. Now grown, her search takes her to turn of the century Pleasant Valley, Wisconsin. When the clues she finds lead her to a mental asylum, Thea uses her experience as a post-mortem photographer to gain access and assist groundskeeper Simeon Coyle in photographing the patients and uncovering the secrets within. That already sounds so good. However, she never expected her personal quest would reawaken the legend of Missy Wayfair, a murdered woman who allegedly haunts the area and whose appearance pretends death. A century later, Heidi Lane receives a troubling letter from her mother, who is battling dementia, compelling her to travel to Pleasant Valley for answers to her own questions of identity. When she catches sight of a ghostly woman haunting the asylum ruins in the woods, the long-standing story of Missy Wayfair returns and with it Heidi's fear for her own life. As two women across time seek answers about their identities and heritage, they must overcome the threat of the mysterious curse that has them inextricably intertwined. That sounds so good. Like, this better be good. This is like chance number two for Jamie Jo Wright, which I feel like I really liked the first one, but I want to love this one. And I've heard it's really spooky. So, I hope it's good. And that is going to be it. Those are 38 books. This was a way longer video than it probably should have been, but hopefully you found some new books that you can add to your TBR. Let me know if there's any that you did or if there's any you're really excited for me to read and hear my thoughts on. But if you have nothing else to say and you just want to leave a comment and share some love, go ahead and leave a peach emoji down below because I'm really excited to read Peaches and Scream. It just makes me so happy. So leave a peach emoji down below. Thank you so, so much for watching. I love you guys so, so much. God bless you and I'll see you in my next video. Bye friends.